hello uh, and welcome to Spaminar. This is our monthly online gathering for live theater prop professionals and anyone who's just really interested in stage props. Uh, I am Erin Prather. Uh, I am a Spam member uh, and I am also uh, the props director at Hartford Stage up here in Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm really, really excited uh, that you've all joined us today. So a little bit about Spam. Um, Spam was formed in 1994 to create a fellowship among prop professionals uh, to address issues of common importance and create parity with other production areas. We're an association of professional prop educators and managers from non-for-profit producing organizations with an international communication and support network that shares resources, information, solutions, and techniques, as well as safety information, uh, and continuing education, and of course, uh, a little bit from our stock as well. Uh, we promote the highest professional standards among prop artisans and craftspeople and the field of props to potential props professionals uh, while working to establish educational standards for the training of prop artisans. We now have over 150 active members reaching from Hawaii to Ireland and Canada to Florida. Um, so as with previous Spaminars, we are requesting a pay what you can donation to help support this programming, as well as our annual grants for early career prop professionals. Uh, if you can afford to donate, the link will be in the chat during this session, and we truly, truly appreciate uh, any help that you can give. Uh, we've also enabled live transcriptions for this webinar. Uh, if you'd like to use them, go ahead and click on the live transcript button down at the bottom uh, and then select uh, show subtitle. Um, alternatively, you can click view full transcript to see it in the meeting in the side panel over there. So tonight, tonight we are going to be taking a look at some cool prop builds accomplished by SPAM member Jay Lasnick and his team of prop artisans at Penn State University. Uh, Jay is the prop supervisor and props teacher at Penn State University School of Theater. Prior to his arrival in central Pennsylvania, he was the assistant prop supervisor at the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, the senior crafts artisan for the San Francisco Opera Costume Shop, props master for Western Opera Theater National Tours, the Magic Theater, the Eureka Theater, and Mountain Play. He also works as a set designer and scenic artist. Jay was the puppet track technician for Ka by Cirque du Soleil at the MGM Casino and Hotel in Las Vegas, and was the props lead technician for Cirque's Chris Angel Believe at the Luxor Hotel, Hotel and Casino. Uh, so I'm your moderator and host for the evening. Uh, if you have any questions as we're looking at uh, the different pieces that Jay is here to talk to us about, go ahead and pop those in the chat. Uh, a lot of times we'll have, a, we'll still have some time for a Q&A uh, at the end, but we'll go ahead and as as we're looking at things as questions come up, go ahead and pop them in the chat so we can sort of have a little bit more of a dialogue going on this one. Because uh, we're looking at cool stuff, of course, we want to talk about it. Uh, so please uh, throw your questions in the chat. I'll ask them to Jay and we can get that great conversation going. So be sure to stick around to the end to hear about our upcoming Spaminars and other ways that you can interact and learn from our membership. And with that, Let's get it started and get things rolling. Jay, how are you doing? You, Aaron, I'm great. How are you? Fantastic. I can't wait to see all this cool stuff you're going to show us. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> can't believe I did all that. Um, hey, everybody. <laughs> I'm really glad you're here. And before I start, I just want to give a shout out to everybody in Spaminar, uh, a group that I helped put together when the pandemic started. And uh, we wanted to give back. And I called a couple people and we all got together. And I think that we put together a really awesome thing. So I just want to make sure everybody who's uh, working on Spaminar gets uh, acknowledged. And I'm really happy to be here as a presenter. Um, so Aaron, look, I found my favorite, I found my favorite t-shirt. My That's icon, amazing. blue t-shirt just for tonight. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to share my screen with everybody. Uh, here we go. My name is Jay Lasnick, and uh, as you know, I work at uh, Penn State University as the prop supervisor. And um, I put down my email address there. If you're, uh, if you're a student and you have some ideas, some problems, uh, want some mentoring one time, or 
ongoing, get in touch with me. If you're a fellow educator, want to throw some ideas off, you know, get in touch. Uh, if you're a professional at a regional theater, have some ideas, a problem, you know, talking with each other is the best thing. That's how I solve problems. So um, let's get on with it. I'm going to start with one of the most exciting things that I've ever built. And that's the Beholder um, puppet from She Kills Monsters that we did a couple years ago. Uh, this puppet was designed by Becca Acuff. And uh, after Becca does her uh, a couple weeks at uh, American Players Theater in Wisconsin, she's off to the Bucks County Playhouse as prop supervisor there. And I'm going to give out as many shout outs to people as I can because it's a you know, it's a collaborative process, it's a team process, and I clearly did not do any of this by myself. So this was the final design. And I looked at it and I looked at it and I thought, how am I going to build this? Admittedly, a lot, most, most of the things that I'm given, these unusual designs, I have no idea how I'm going to build them. And to me, that's part of the excitement of, of what we do. Um, so, you know, in, uh, in Facebook, you can save postings. So I have lots of different categories. And years ago, I'd say when I first got here, maybe five years ago, even before, I saw this, um, this posting from uh, University of, of um, Southern New York, and they did a show called Honk, and the technicians and the builders there, they did a video, it's on Facebook, and I saved it not knowing I would ever use it, but I thought someday I might need to use it. So I looked at their video, and I looked at how they did it, and I thought, well, it's not the same, because ours is a six-foot diameter eyeball, but the techniques that they use to build this are they apply, they're similar, they're pra practically the same. So uh, we used two inch insulation foam. And what I uh, realized, pretty obvious, is that the top and the bottom are exactly the same. Now, the foam being four feet by eight feet, it's actually four one by eight one, if you're, if you're really um, specific about that. Uh, I realized that I could only get half of a ring out of each piece. So each, each uh, ring of foam was built by two pieces of foam. And as the uh, outside angles decreased, the radius is also decreased. So I'm gonna show you a little more specific about that. So I hooked up a jig to our um, adjustable bandsaw table. And this was the beginning of the action. This is the middle of the action. This is the end of the action. And here's a better slide that describes what I was just talking about. As the table angle increased, the center distance from the blade decreased this way. So I adjusted the table with some uh, C, C wrenches and then I would just move up a screw that was the center of the radius and moving that forward. Uh, here's a cool picture of some of the pieces. And uh, this was a mock-up, uh, kind of a rough fit that I call it. Um, you know, people, that, the students that are working in the shop now and ever since I've been here and even when uh, in my career before here, I was always a very, big fan of, of the theory of every day being able to look back at your work and seeing that it's different. It doesn't have to be significantly different, but before I leave you know, out the door, I like to look back and go, okay, well, there's this thing. Now it looks like this. So this, this shape was just a, you know, a thrown together pile of of foam before. Now, I mean, in my mind's eye, I can start to see a circle uh, basically being created out of it. Uh, 
we used one of my favorite adhesives, if this might come up in a question later, the answer is 3M fast bond um, uh, adhesive. And it's water soluble and it works really well on things like this. So you can see it's starting to come together. And as you can see here uh, in the picture, every other ring was offset and that created more strength. If we just put half circle, half circle, half circle, half circle, lined up with the next one and the preceding one, it would, it would not be strong at all. And we'd be relying 100% on the glue. And here, because we could offset them, it was just a built-in, like a log cabin kind of thing. So I think the next picture is um, uh, more of the shape coming together. You can see there's some spaces here where the foam didn't quite uh, match up. And that's because I was using some scrap pieces of foam and we just filled these in later with, you know, with little pieces. One Anyways. quick question, Jay. Yeah. We have me. a question from the chat and that is, how did you figure out the angle that you needed to cut the rings on the band saw? It's from Mel Edwards. That's a great question. And believe it or not, I have a picture of that uh, somewhere and I can get it to you. So I will describe how I did it. Uh, and then I'll, I'll get it to you somehow. Um, I took a piece of brown butcher paper and I drew a, a vertical line and a diagonal line representing one quarter of a circle. And then I took my two inch straight edge because these are two inches of foam, two inch pieces of foam and drew pencil lines going horizontally. Then I took my uh, trammel points and I drew in my quarter of a circle this way. So at the end of the circle or the, uh, the arc of one quarter, let me say, I could then take uh, another tool and measure each degree going this way. That's the basic description with words. But we have your address and we'll, we'll get it later. In fact, when we put this on YouTube, I'll make sure it's included. Great, so, yeah. thank you. Thank you for asking. Of course. Um, so I think the next picture is, uh, well, I'd like to have a lot of fun in the shop as many of you know. So here's the, you know, the age old question, how many prop artisans can you fit inside of a light bulb? Uh, oh, sorry, an eyeball. Uh, this is Grisel and Bea and Jesse and the one who's hiding is back of the designer. So the answer is four props artisans. All right, so we went on to putting the eye on the big ball. Uh, the eyeball was made the same way, except at the back of that, uh, the pieces, there was a piece of glued on plywood with some pre-inserted bolts. And then those bolts went through these, uh, the bigger uh, globe there. And then that attached to some nuts and some, uh, some washers and some nuts. We added an upper lip and some teeth. And for those of you who've seen the show and done the show, you know that Vera is killed by getting stabbed in the eye with a sword. So we needed to make sure that our sword fit in there. And we eventually put in some black foam in there with a little slit. So it would just, it would just go in every, every time perfectly and filled in the gaps with some spray foam you can see there on the left. Okay, so here's the basic shape. And now we're, uh, I'm thinking about when I thought about it before, but now we're putting together how it's gonna move around, how it's gonna move around the stage. So this will be coming up in a couple pictures. Inside is a three inch PVC tube that runs all the way up to the top. And then there's a uh, piece of foam up there that has a three inch hole in it. So the pipe just kind of goes up into the, the top, the bottom of the top of the eyeball. 
And then as you can see on the bottom, I built a rolling dolly and there's some wood, kind of a floor, let's say, that the bottom is sitting on. So it was kind of hanging from the top and sitting on the bottom. So we've got pressure and structure from both directions, which made it incredibly strong. If it was just the top or the bottom, it would have failed. Uh, here's a demo of us putting it together. Now, I just wanna point out the eyeball is six feet in diameter, but you can see here, we're putting it together in two parts. And that's because I kept with my theme that I'm trying to uh, live every day in the shop and pass on to the students and the crew. Just think ahead because the door to the prop shop is five foot nine. This was six feet. So I didn't want to build the six feet eyeball and then realize we can't take it to the theater. So it's in two parts. You can see the PVC tube there going up. Uh, here's it coming together. It's uh, almost done. So there's a couple of ways we communicated to the audience that this uh, eyeball died. One is, uh, well, the eyelids, the top and the bottom eyelids, which will be um, added in a couple slides here, did move up and down. So the lids would close. That signifies a, a death in a way. And then we also thought, well, wouldn't it be great if the tongue just kind of rolled out? So I ordered a red yoga mat and um, some of the crew put together a contraption inside there. Okay. And Ready? that's what it looked like. So we eventually cut it into shape, but that was great. I loved it. Uh, here, Bea is uh, starting on painting it. Uh, kind of a funny story. Uh, Bea is our recent, one of our recent MFA graduates in scenic design. Bea is from Peru. Uh, the first day I met her was the first day of school. And uh, we said, hello, how are you? And then I said, uh, you're making this giant eyeball with Becca. So go have fun. And this was her first project in our crazy prop shop. Uh, we added the eyelashes, the eyelids, the bottom lip, which also did move. Some detail pictures here. And um, us loading it in. We have a great question from Helen yeah. Stratacus, and that is, what did you use to coat the foam with? I believe that we used, we used a combination of foam coat and sculpt coat And it's a combination because if I recall, we ran out of one of them and we had the other. So that's, what you do when you run out of stuff and you're, you have no more budget money left. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Mm -mm. Wait a minute, son. why isn't it moving? Oh my God. Oh, because I was pressing the wrong button. <laughs> okay, um, so here's a stage shot. Uh, on the left and on the right. And oops, I think if, so I was trying to make a window go below. There we go. And uh, this was our big full stage shot. Uh, it's one of the beautiful thing. I, I loved working on this project. Um, of course, I really wanted to keep this puppet for as long as we could. So we brought it over to our shops and then the pandemic happened. So I made a meme, uh, if Vera can wear a mask, you can wear a mask. And uh, so that was up for a while. I don't know if it motivated anybody, but it was fun. And then I was told, Jay, we really don't want that. Well, someone didn't want it anymore. So uh, we got rid of most of it, but I kept the best part. 
And uh, now if anybody asks where the prop shop is, they're told if you can find the giant eyeball, then you found the prop shop. Anyway, we're gonna move on to another fun, couple fun projects uh, that we did. This was a couple of shows that we did. Oh, I'm sorry. One no. quick question from Michael Hatton to you about, uh, can you share the mechanics on the moving eyes and lips? Um, what I can tell you on online right now is it obviously was um, a contraption of strings and pulleys, but uh, I'll write that down as another thing that can be in the, uh, the epilogue of the YouTube video. Sounds great, so, thank you. Let me just write that down. So, uh, mm -hmm. tongue video, okay. So we did a year with Frog and Toad. Many of you have done that. This was designed by Tanya Berenchera. Uh, she now works at uh, Southern Arkansas University as a design teacher there. So this show was full of props and crafts and right up my, my wheelhouse. Um, what I'm gonna share with you first is this huge lily pad. And uh, this was Tanya's uh, design. And I used some Sintra. If uh, people don't know what that is, it's a brand name, but it's basically PVC in a sheet. And uh, it's a thermoplastic, so you can heat it up with a heat gun. And when we heated it up with our heat gun, we did not produce any fumes. Oh, I'm sorry, any, um, any visible you know, fumes that you could see there. So we just did it in our spray booth with a low heat and a fan behind us and the spray booth in front of us. So the whatever off-gassing there was would just go, but we did not melt it. It didn't turn a color. So um, in case people are wondering, this is, uh, this is Becca Unsworth, uh, my assistant for the summer, who's now at uh, Phoenix, I wrote it down, Phoenix Theater Company as the scenic charge there. Um, here we bandsawed shapes of the Sintra. I screwed it into a piece of foam that we carved. Um, and this is kind of a, many steps later, uh, painted them. I built this uh, hexagon out of some four by fours. Uh, drywall screwed them to it. And just I just kept adding and adding and adding and adding. And then this is what it became. Uh, this is uh, Becca and I making a smaller flower here, same process. And this was the giant lily pad that Tanya had designed that we had built. Scenery built the platform down there, which I believe was an inch and a half thick plywood uh, with uh, really gnarly casters underneath. And uh, you can see the cattails on left and right. Uh, those are uh, about half inch or five eighths inch uh, steel rod that I welded to a plate to, and then um, lag bolted them to the deck so that they could be used as handles and they could move around because, uh, you know, I just hate set changes where people have to bend over. So we added these uh, cattails. So see both of them and some grasses. Uh, here it is in action. Toad takes a bath uh, in it. Um, and now we're going on to the magic mushrooms. So the magic mushrooms were made out of uh, the top, as you can see, is a two inch foam still glued together with the fast bond adhesive. The stem is, uh, I believe, three inch PVC with some uh, packing foam around it so I could create the shape, gaff tape that, and then I stitched on some FOSS shape, a FOSS shape sleeve, which then we steam heat to shrink it down and attach it to it. And here's a picture of Becca cutting some of the FOSS shape on the top of the mushroom after she's uh, steam, steam heated it. 
there's an action shot of it. And then at the bottom, uh, we added some, just some muslin in this uh, pleated uh, pattern here, just like a mushroom. And here's some cool pics. So they all got uh, LEDs in them. And these were, the, the mushroom stems fit over a steel pipe, which is bolted to the stage floor. So there's no way that they could tip over. And in fact, the small one was used as a stool for the toad. It's a toad stool. All right, and here's some cool pictures that I took. I think they look pretty awesome. All right, so this next section is about the acorn mailbox uh, with hat. So uh, this is uh, the inside of Toad's house. Just as a side note, you can see there's two stools uh, I made. Those are giant um, spools of thread and the tabletop is a big mason jar lid. Um, I don't, I didn't put pictures of that in on, uh, for, this, for this presentation tonight, maybe another. But the way I made the um, acorn mailbox was laminated some foam together, slapped it on the end of the lathe and kind of shaped it into the mushroom. I mean the, um, sorry, the acorn and used FOSS shape on the top. And I'm gonna admit now, I'm gonna tell you in a second how I made a mistake. Um, the FOSS shape on the top worked great for the hat. As you can see there, I'm steaming it. And then I used some Mod Podge to kind of set the FOSS shape in a way. Um, now here's the body of the acorn. The acorn was hanging off of the side of the house. So it wanted to fall forward, so to speak, like that. And I ended up putting in some aluminum banding. This was one case where I didn't think ahead very well. So I, I ended up putting some banding in there and pop riveting it to it. And it, it ended up working. But in retrospect, I should have used some carbon fiber. I would have used the same shape but just aluminum foiled it and then brushed on some epoxy, then some carbon fiber, and there we would have had it. Then it would have been a completely solid shape, thin and light, lightweight. So I admit sometimes when I make mistakes. Um, this is me demoing the hat part of the acorn. Uh, you know, if we ask other people to do something, we got to do it ourselves so it fits. Uh, Here's a, here's a great slide of uh, another way I like to have fun in the shop. Um, I asked Becca to make, uh, make the newspaper that Toad reads later in the show. And, um, you know, I asked her to, to make, uh, make some inside jokes and whatnot. Anyway, we ended up reviewing the same show that the newspaper's in. And this was on the back page and I don't know whether the audience saw it or not. It didn't really matter to me if they did. I think it's a fun show, might as well have some fun. And um, apparently it was a smashing success. We also had um, different articles honoring different uh, designers in, in the show. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna move on to a big, big project that we did during the school year. Uh, the Angels in America Wings designed by Kaylee Warner, who's now at the Alliance Theater in Atlanta. Um, Rick Lombardo, our uh, director for the show, said he wanted an 18 foot wingspan. And this is an, a prime example again. I have no idea how we're gonna do it, but it forces you to, to talk to people, to be creative, to think of things that won't ever be used, but you know, we have to go through that process. So um, this was a great project that incorporated so many different departments. It was a, a truly collaborative effort. So this was Kaylee's design. And this was the flying rig 
that the um, scene shop built. And um, you'll see later, but this rig eventually ended up having a lot of upholstery foam on the back, obviously a lot of harnesses and cables and whatnot. So that was done by the scene shop. Uh, the prop shop was in charge of the armature of it. And I did some research uh, on, on YouTube mostly. Um, there's a lot of wings out there. Uh, cosplay has really done so much to, to put this information uh, out in the public, but there were five or six different designs I liked and I kind of settled on one and thought, well, I'll make a wooden mock-up of the, of the steel uh, rigging frame uh, and use some PVC to see how it works. So I put this together and, you know, adjusted some things here and there and, and whatnot. It seemed to work pretty well. There's a, a long view of it. Uh, once I did this, I handed off to our, one of our uh, MFA students at the time and uh, and they took it over from, from there, basically. Uh, here's a picture of the air cylinders that we used. Uh, they had about a 12 inch throw and uh, they were put design, they were uh, assembled in an X fashion, but obviously if they were on the same plane, they'd hit each other. So one was offset just by about an inch. So they could, they could do that. The feathers were taken care of by the costume craft department. Uh, this was just, I think, 1 16th EVA foam. And for those of you who have seen the show or done the show, you know a single feather falls down before the angel makes her appearance. And uh, on the right here is a picture of that feather. There's a, a piece of wire in it. And we throw it down from the grid, and then we added a washer, you can see under the gray gaff tape there. And I think we ended up maybe with, maybe it was a quarter or two washers, but it just had to be weighted the, the perfect amount. And, uh, and it did. Here's a great picture uh, that uh, I was thankful to get uh, from, from the uh, costume shop. You can see all the different one through 32 at least different feathers on each side, um, each a different size that had some millinery wire hanging or uh, made into a circle at the end. And then the bottom picture, you can see the little bolts that are drilled through holes in the PVC and the nut on the bolt could not be tightened down uh, they were nylock nuts, so they would just go in and once you tighten them, they'd stay. But if they were tightened down to the PVC, obviously the, the feathers could not float open and close. Here's a detail pictures of that. Now, as you can see here on the right side picture, I've written PVC top here. But what we discovered, I think this was a day before load-in, maybe two days, if I remember right. Uh, the weight of the feathers was too heavy and it was actually bending the PVC. You know, one feather, it weighs nothing, but you get 45 or 50 feathers on there, it's gonna weigh something. So I ended up changing that to some um, electrical conduit pipe. Here's some more of the construction in detail. You can see I've added the, PV, the uh, conduit pipe here on the left and then put uh, kind of some uh, pool noodle material over that to soften it. And a bunch of feathers there on the right. You can see the loops at the bottom. Here's the wings uh, in full display. And Here's, you can see the conduit is, is showing there. And here's a video of them opening. And 
we knew that they only really needed to open. They really didn't need to close on stage. So we were only concerned with them going this way. Here we are uh, throwing it in the truck. Some loading in on stage pictures. Some pre-tech testing pictures. And uh, this shot by Will Wellman, uh, one of the best pictures uh, I think I've ever seen uh, of this. It's just composed very beautifully to me. And uh, this is a video I'm going to show you in a second. As you know, uh, once that first feather comes down, then the, the stage shakes uh, violently. And uh, there were a couple slip stages for this design. And the bed was on one of them, as you can see. And this one was hand operated stage left. And it was quite by accident that we discovered this. So, you know, the cue goes, the bed comes on and then it stops short. And the whole bed kind of goes like this. The nightstand, which was just placed there, kind of started falling over. The actor grabbed it. And what we discovered was if the, if the slip stage operator could move the handles back and forth and back and forth like this, then the whole bed would also shake like this. So I ended up putting a little eye hook connecting the nightstand to the headboard. I screwed the lamp down to the table. And as you know, there's a lot of prescription drugs on the nightstand. In previous scenes, those were all loose bottles, but in between scenes, those loose bottles came off and then the stage crew Velcroed on a piece of um, Luan that had a bunch of hot glued bottles on. So that would never fall. And so the nightstand and the light would go like this and the bed would go like this. So what we used um, for the stuff that falls down was uh, three different things. We used those um, paper ceiling tiles that are in the drop ceilings. Uh, we just broke them apart into chunks like this size. Then we added some oatmeal and some cornstarch. So the first thing that came down was the oatmeal. And it created this really nice kind of tapping sound on the stage, which was really cool. And then the kind of the haziness, the, the fogginess of the cornstarch uh, kind of hung in the air. And then the uh, paper tiles fell down. And it was a very cheap, very easy, very non-toxic way to do stuff and kind of easy to clean up. Um, so moving on. Okay. So the curious not incident of the dog in the nighttime boxes. Um, it's a very popular show right now. I'm sure some of you have done it or seen it. Uh, this was designed by Rozzy Isquith, a recent MFA graduate also from here, just a couple, two weeks ago. Uh, you know, when we, you come back from a pandemic, why not do a huge technical show? Why not? So um, the, the big prop for this show was, uh, there's a lot of hand props, uh, but there were a lot of boxes in this show. And the boxes needed to do a bunch of different things. We're always asking, of course, as you know, what do you want it to look like and what do you want them to do? So we know that they needed to be lightweight. We know that they needed to be strong. We know that they needed to be sittable and standable. And the front of the big boxes, which had um, Lexan, clear plastic on it. I just put Plexi as a generic name there. 
that also needed to be standable. And they all of them, all of the boxes, 12 needed to light up with color changing LEDs. And we had in house four remote controllers. And so we had to buy eight manual controllers. Uh, here's a quick look at Rossi's drafting. And once I got this, of course, I'm thinking, what can we make it out of? Luckily, we planned this show before we went on summer break. So I had all summer to do mock-ups and figure out how we were going to build these and how I was going to teach other crew people how to build them. Um, so I thought my first instinct was to use some hex comb cardboard. And then as I thought more, well, what can we attach to the outside of it? And would the non-solidness of it get me into trouble later? So I opted for uh, one of my go-tos, it's appearing to be uh, the two inch wall insulation foam. So this picture on the left was the first mock-up I did. Uh, I put it together, the, all the foam, and then I made a stress skin on the outside of Luan put together with the fast bond. And then you can see on the right, I put some milky plexi vertically. That's where the LEDs would eventually sit. Again, for me, I'm trying to be as visual as I can, because that helps me move forward. So I, I called down our TD at the time. Um, and I, you know, I said, well, well, what do you think of this? He said, it's great, except it's going to move a little this way on the corner. So, excuse me, why don't you make some hog trough corners and inset them, as you can see here on the left. So I could have put them on the inside without insetting them, but it just wouldn't have been as strong. And now the corner structure becomes part of the horizontal and the vertical planes. Um, and you can see on the right side, a picture of the hog trough corners with the Luan stress skin. You can also see a nylon bolt right there, which I'm gonna get to in a bit. Now, um, I wanted to do something even more to increase the strength of the foam. So for a long time, I had always thought, I joked around, well, why aren't there something called a foam bolt? And uh, if any of you who follow me on you know, Facebook or Instagram, you've seen this picture, but I took a half inch drill bit, drilled it all the way in, uh, blew out the, the bits of dust and then poured in some Foamit 25 from Smooth On. And that's, I think that's the hardest foam that they make. And then this was just a sample. Then I bandsawed it. This thing will not, it will not come apart. So we had, we had um, the foam glued to itself. We had the inset hog trough corners. We had a stress skin of Luan on, on all sides, uh, inside, outside, top, bottom, everywhere. And then on the top going down, we had these foam bolts. I think they're cool. And as you can see here on the right, uh, we had to use some bar clamps to keep them down over, overnight while it dried. I think it's a cool idea. Use it yourself. Let me know how it goes. Um, then I created some jigs to route out all the foam. You can see here, and then a little test fit over here on the right. Uh, just some more um, working, figuring out how the handles are going to go in. Uh, here's a side of uh, one of the side of uh, the pieces of wood being made into a handle and uh, gluing on some of the fast line comes in green color and clear. And I'm really glad that we used the green color because if we used clear on the green foam, we might not have been able to see to see it very well. So this was a good idea. Um, now, Originally, I thought that the Milky Plexi needed to sit inside of its own groove, so to speak. 
And then as I started, you know, working with this and touching all these materials, I discovered, well, if I'm putting the Luan on the front, I'm in essence already creating the trough that the Milky Plexi is going to sit in, which is demonstrated here on the left. We figured out that the, the little trough needed to be about an inch deep, and then we painted all three sides of it white so that the, the LEDs, no matter in which direction they pointed, it would still pop out through it. Uh, here's a demo of, uh, of the LEDs in there. Just an overnight drying picture. Some uh, finishing pictures here. And here's uh, some pictures. Of course, this is Rosie picking it up. We can demonstrate that it was lightweight. And then we see me standing on it because I was told that the front of it needed to be standable. And we can all say this together. Did they ever stand on it? No, they never stood on it, but they could. So anyway, things like that happen. Um, you'll probably ask how much did it weigh? Um, if I recall, the big boxes here weighed about 30 pounds. 15 of it was just the Lexan. The rest of it was just the foam, the glue and the Luan, which I think is pretty good. Now we're into production. Of course, there's wires connected to LEDs and the wires need to be hidden. So inside of these hog trough corners, I had to cut out, well, before I assemble them, cut out a little square of wood and then route in a little trough so the wire could lay down flat in that, covered it with some gaff tape, and then we could put our stress skin Luan on top of that. So the wire was completely hidden and inside. Remember when I was talking about leaving each day, seeing the work that you've done, having it be different. This was something I did one day. I went, okay, we're moving along. We're moving along. I can see it. I can see it. The right picture shows some uh, plywood that we glued in to, to attach the piano hinge because the small and the medium boxes had lids that opened up. And this is uh, Bea, she's demonstrating in a picture that I sent to rehearsal where the manual controllers would be for the boxes that were manually controlled. And so that in rehearsal, and they had cardboard boxes that were the same size as the interior because all these boxes get props put in them so they could figure out which props would go in each box. The stage managers could tell the actors, this is what you're gonna to have to do to get to the controller. So there were no surprises. Continuing on. Now, I alluded to this earlier. The plexiglass needs to be attached to something because you just can't put metal bolts or nylon bolts through plex, you know, through Lexan into the foam, it'll just pop right out. So I would do this completely different. I admit that. But at the time, this was what I came up with. And so I glued uh, some epoxy, some nuts to some Luan, and then carved in some spaces where these big um, nut washer kind of devices could kind of implant themselves into the foam. And then once we drilled the hole in the plexi, then the bolt would go through the plexi into this nut. And with the pressure coming, forcing outward on the plexi, the bolts would not pop through the foam. If I were to do this again, the whole thing, the whole line from the first uh, piece of Luan to the fourth piece of Luan would just be a piece of plywood. The whole thing, just like I did the back of the lid there, be the same thing. And then I could, um, I could screw it in basically. So, you know, it's not always perfect. Uh, this is a little trap door I put in for the battery and the remote control for the larger boxes. I didn't wanna have to ask the stage crew to turn the boxes over 
or upside down to get to the batteries and all that. So they would just lift these up every night and charge them and that was that. Uh, here's another picture that we sent to rehearsal because I wanted them to know where they could stood on it. So as you can tell, I'm a real fan of communicating, overly communicating to rehearsal. The green indicates, I hope obviously, where you can stand and the red indicates where you can't stand because there's nothing back there. <laughs> there's no wood, there's no Lexan, there's nothing. I think you actually could stand there, but we didn't want to tell them. So here's some stage shots. Uh, here, I think in this scene, they're watching TV, so to speak. And uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. I think they looked awesome, I do say so. Some different colors. Here's a great, uh, great picture. Just checking the time. Okay. And more curious, Wellington the dog. He's the dog that gets killed that the whole show's about. Uh, as you can see behind uh, Lorena here, she's uh, one of our MFA students right now. See, there's two silhouettes of dogs in the back there. That's because we just weren't quite sure what size of a dog we should have. So I asked the crew to make two different sizes, go to the theater, get the designer and the director in the middle of the theater. You guys take a look at it, pick one, then we can make the, the prop because once we make it, we're not gonna make it bigger or smaller. So uh, we cut out the piece of plywood, Lorena welded some tubing to this uh, plate of a quarter inch steel. We figured out which direction the pitchfork needed to go. Add the two inch carved foam, some upholstery foam, and then your uh, fur over that. And this is Lorena uh, and uh, me getting ready to load it in. I still don't know why I put painter's tape around Wellington's mouth. There must've been good reason that day. But uh, anyway, this is the stage shot. This is what the audience saw when they first came into the play. Obviously sets the tone for the whole show. And uh, after the show, I thought we needed a shop dog. So Wellington kind of hang hung out, you know, near the table saw and near the Swedish clock I made for little night music and the paint shop and uh, kind of hung out with the stage manager's dog for a bit. And uh, now he's uh, asleep in my office. So, because I was not going to put him in a plastic bag and put him on the shelf somewhere for, you know, no one does ever see again. So, all right. Well, the timing is great. Uh, we've got about six or seven minutes left and then we'll be at the end and take more questions and answers. So uh, this was the second show I ever worked on here at Penn State called Argonautica, designed by Gina Jocelyn in 2017. A lot of different puppets for that show. I'm going to focus on the bull puppets. Uh, these puppets are eight feet long, operated by two people each. This is her design. So uh, we have a full, we have a box of like 20 of these hair cutting heads. So I put them on some old dress forms and uh, made this rig. We got, I knew that this, these were gonna be a two backpack puppet each. So, you, you know, we started at the, at the base, we started with the person, got, we found out the heights of each of the actors and made these uh, mock-up people, the heights of each of those four performers, and then uh, built the uh, heat shape PVC around those backpacks. And then I attached, oh, sorry, we attached uh, some aluminum banding with some bolts, but we also used one of my favorite tools, the pneumatic pop rivet gun. And if you don't have one, I suggest you go get one because it will save your forearms and your project will just move quite along. It's great for morale. Um, here's uh, Becca and Gina testing it, right? I'm never gonna ask someone to do something I haven't done or I've asked someone else to do. So I had them walk around the scene shop and then report back. 
you know, could you mostly hear each other? Could you hear each other give commands? Who's the who's going to be the leader? Who's going to be the follower? Who's going to say go? Who well, you got to start on your left foot, etc. All those kinds of things. Those were important so that we could teach the actors later. Um, here it's moving along, moving along. Uh, Roderick McLeod using the pneumatic pop rivet gun here. You know, with our with our budgets and us doing nine performances, I have to decide, you know, where the best place to put the money is. And it was better that we put it into the aluminum and some other materials instead of something that was heavier um, and that we couldn't use again for the, the outward skin of these bull puppets. So we used cardboard. And I'm a fan of cardboard and foam core. It's old school, but it works. And then we coated it with some muslin, just glue water muslin. Now this whole time we're doing this, once I saw this, I thought, I wonder, I wonder if it's gonna to be too heavy. <laughs> it was light, you know, it was again, just like the other stuff, like the, lee, uh, the uh, feathers. Well, one feather is great, a hundred feathers, it's not so great. A couple pieces of cardboard, it's great, but then you do a full puppet with it and then you add glue and water and muslin, it's not so light anymore. So um, here they are being painted, obviously. And then I came up with kind of a, I thought a good compromise solution, which was to cut out the middle and show the work of the, of the puppet, show the structure of it, not the work, so to speak. But, you know, we're not pretending that these are real bulls. I mean, there are obviously people in them. And why not? So um, this is a, it's kind of an artsy picture I took, put a black and white filter on. Uh, this was how we stored them in the theater. This was, this was in our pavilion theater, kind of a small, very small space. So they had to be hung from the grid. The actors would come down, stand on their footprint um, spikes. Then this would come down, they'd buckle in, then they'd be led with, by an ASM to their entrance. And here's some great stage shots. So, Aaron, do you think we have time for some bonus pictures? Yeah, I think we've got some time for some bonus pictures. If you have any questions as we're looking at these bonus pictures, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Uh, it's great to have Jay as a resource. We can ask him anything we want. I'm here. Okay. That's good. Good we do because I made this slide. It says bonus pictures. Uh, I just wanted to share something I'm really proud of. This was not done at Penn State. This was done uh, when I was back in San Francisco uh, after I was the props uh, supervisor there for three years. They asked me to come back and build this uh, cow intestine sculpture and it's still famous. Um, this was a show where the actors danced and the dancers acted. And this sculpture was a la the British um, artist Damien Hirst, who's famous for putting a shark in formaldehyde and cutting, cutting a cow in half and a sheep in half and various other animals and, and whatnot. So here's some pictures of, the, of it. This is a, a picture of the mold I made. I would do it a little differently if I did it now, but even though this was back in 1990, I do it almost the same. I made some half round molds and then poured in some pink latex. And I've really not used latex since then because there's so many other great materials, but this, for this case, it really worked. So latex sticks to itself. So once I had all these half round shapes and they were about a one yard long, I glued them to each other and made a tube. Okay, that's where the, the overworking was done. If I did it now, I would just make a tube shape and pour stuff in and let that dry and then pull that out. But yeah, I didn't know as much then as I do now. So anyway, made the half rounds, glued them together, then glued all these 
one yard pieces together uh, into tubes, put a string through the top of them because they were hanging up in the sculpture when the audience came in. And then the, the pieces hanging down from it were just glued on. Those didn't have string in them. Um, this is a full stage shot. And a uh, funny story, um, the whole time I had heard rumors, really wasn't in a rehearsal report if I can recall, but the whole time I was hearing rumors that the, the director would really like the cow intestine sculpture to drip. So I ask, uh, what kind of drips? What do you want it to do? How long should it drip for? Um, is it, does it recycle? You know, is it, is it dripping for 30 minutes? If it's, if it's uh, dripping for 30 minutes, then we need to have like a recirculating pump. And you can see a bunch of muslin, like artists cloth down on the bottom there. Well, we, we need to have some troughs kind of to, to catch it. And then you've got this whole slippery, you know, slipping problem and whatnot. So we ended up finally a couple of days before tech, I think we got word, yes, we, we need drips. So you can see um, kind of on the right side, there's a, a scoop of some uh, intestine right there. That's just aquarium tubing that's coated in the um, latex. And we made up our solution of, uh, of goo. It was um, soap, uh, dish soap, and glycerin and some lubricant and because it needed to you know drip needed to drip the right way and before the audience came in the stage crew loaded up uh, I think there were three of these in different locations about I think they were about two feet long loaded them up and there were previously drilled holes in the bottom of the tubing which I failed to mention and then put a cork in the top so it worked great, people loved it. And then I got a note um, that said, oh, the director would like the drips to drip more dramatically. And seeming that I had been asking for weeks and weeks, how would you like the drips to drip? How would you like the drips to drip? What do you want them to do? I thought, and I loved working here. It's just a funny story. Uh, I thought that I should just get my final check and, and leave, so. So I don't know whether they ever dripped dramatically, but they were, um, they dripped and it was nice and gross. And that's the way we want it to be. And I think that's the end. So Yay! I will stop sharing. And what did we come in here at? Perfect timing, one hour, time. just like I rehearsed. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. That was okay. some of the coolest prop stuff I've seen uh, in a while. Awesome Good work. Yeah. Yeah. So any last questions you have for Jay, this is your last chance to just go ahead and drop those questions in the chat. Um, yeah. Whether it was about the eye of the beholder or those awesome uh, bull puppets, any questions that you all have. Mm. Ah, another question from Mel. Uh, have you ever used elastomeric to coat foam? No, but I will now, I guess. <laughs> nice little roofing. Uh, Thanks. Uh, Thanks for the reference. Nice. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was a awesome, super cool evening. Um, nice. All right, uh, everybody out there in audience land, it's time to get your Sharpies and mark your calendars for our next Spaminar. So on June 12th, uh, members of our anti-oppression committee um, will join us to talk about the anti-oppression anti in the world of props, uh, giving real life examples on how equity, diversity, and inclusion show up in the props world. And this will be a panel discussion and open dialogue around SPAM's anti-oppression work and how we can create a safer, safer and more equitable environment for everyone. So that is on June 12th. You're really not gonna wanna miss that one. Um, then uh, July, we're taking summer vacation because you know, why not? It's summer vacation. So July, we're off. Hope you enjoy your summer. 
We are not doing a spam in in July, but we will be back in August. And August is amazing because on August 21st, the one, the only Jen McClure prop supervisor at the Yale Repertory Theater and the David Geffen uh, School of Drama at Yale is going to join us to talk about casting and molding materials. Uh, she's got a lot of great knowledge on that. Really excited to share that with you all. And then finally, on September 18th, we're going to have a discussion about Sweeney Todd. Uh, this uh, with prop supervisors from multiple theaters that have produced the show to talk about how they've sort of tackled the prop challenges uh, sort of from their own perspective. So a bunch of different people who have worked on Sweeney Todd are all going to get together. We're going to talk about Sweeney Todd. Um, so now some of you are probably wondering how you can become a member of SPAM. So if you're a working prop manager, director, supervisor, or any sort of title in that realm uh, at a nonprofit theater or opera company, or an educator who teaches prop classes or prepares students for a career in props, and you're interested in joining SPAM, please, please send our membership committee an email for more information. The uh, email address is membership at propmanagers.org and you can see it, Karen has dropped it in the chat for all of you to see. So feel free, find us on Facebook, on Instagram and YouTube. Uh, those links are all gonna be coming uh, in the chat as well. We love to see you all on those awesome socials. So Spaminar, Jay mentioned that there's a lot of people who go into doing this work. So we're gonna shout out uh, uh, several of them right now. It's produced by the Society of Props Art, Properties Artists and Managers with special thanks to some very special SPAM members, Patrick Drone, who is the Properties Director and Lecturer at the University of Michigan, Larry Heyman, Assistant Professor of Properties Design and Fabrication at OCU School of Theater, Ben Homan, who is the Properties Director at the Utah Shakespeare Festival, Stacey Hornharbor, Properties Master at Salem State University, Nikki Kulas, Props Master at First Stage, Amy Peter, Props Master at the Theater School at DePaul University, and of course, Karen Robbe Vance, Associate Prop Master at the Geffen Playhouse. Thank you all so much for watching. And once again, please keep your suggestions for future Spaminars coming. We wanna know what it is that you wanna learn about. So prop on, and we'll see you next time.